Welcome back. Patients at the Children's Hospital at Erlanger had a special visitor today. Mickey Mouse ditched Minnie. What? And Pluto. <laughs> hey, took a break from his TV job to spend some time with some of his biggest fans. This visit comes ahead of his big show, Disney on Ice, this weekend. Every child got a crown with Mickey ears. Looks like they had a lot of fun. A All right, time. now here's David and Cindy with a look at what's coming up at 6. Thank you, Latrice and Greg. A bug that's relatively new to the Tennessee Valley is not making a very good impression on tree lovers. How this pest is killing trees and what you can do about it. Plus. Uh, so we were, we were very busy yesterday in McMinn County, along with taking those Washington County 911 calls. 911 dispatcher were busy answering calls from several different counties yesterday. Why most emergency calls had to be rerouted. And not one, not two, 14 projects will be completed in the next few years to improve schools in Hamilton County. We'll show you where the money's going. Channel 3 Eyewitness News at 6 is next. With coverage you can count on, this is Channel 3 Eyewitness News at 6. Good afternoon, I'm Cindy Sexton. And I'm David Carroll. Here's what's happening. We're learning why 911 calls were rerouted in 26 counties across Tennessee yesterday. State officials say a software update by a location database company caused a number of 911 calls to be rerouted for about five hours. Channel 3's Natalie Potts tells us which counties were affected in our area. Well, the counties highlighted behind me were affected. Bledsoe, Bradley, Hamilton, Marion, McMinn, and Sequatchie County were all affected by the software glitch. Some 911 calls were delayed, but eventually rerouted back to the correct dispatch center, while other emergency calls were lost completely. Hamilton County 911 dispatchers take about 2,000 calls a day. Around 1.30 Tuesday, the phones stopped ringing. Officials determined all of Hamilton County's calls were being rerouted to Sevier and Jefferson counties 140 miles away. The problem was fixed around 6 p.m., but officials say there is no way of knowing how many calls for help were lost. It was the opposite problem in McMinn County. Those calls kept coming in uh, one right after another, another till 540. Dispatchers there took 80 additional calls from Washington County, some 160 miles away. Severe weather rolling through the area further complicated the problem. Yesterday was a very busy day. We had uh, several straight line winds, I think, come through this county, destroyed uh, mobile home, destroyed, uh, downed a lot of trees, a lot of power lines. Uh, so we were, we were very busy yesterday. In Bradley County, officials know of at least one emergency call from Morgan County that could not be responded to because the caller's information was scrambled. We couldn't speak to anyone uh, and there was no information on the screen except where the, the county that it came from. Director Joe Wilson tells us at least one Bradley County call was sent to the wrong county. He wasn't notified about the lost call until this morning. They notified the state 911 board and, and uh, didn't contact us, so we just now found out about it, but it was one that went to another county. Uh, we'll try to do some follow-up on that and see what the incident was. As of right now, local officials say they haven't heard of anything major uh, being missed, but each rerouted call is being investigated. The glitch was corrected around 6 o'clock last night when the database management company rolled back its new update. Live in the studio, Natalie Potts, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Natalie. Officials with the Tennessee Emergency Communications Board say they are currently developing a statewide database as part of its next generation 911 project that will replace third party database services in the future. And while the glitch was not considered an outage, this is not the first time folks were unable to reach 911. Our NBC affiliate in Nashville says this is the third time this year that thousands have been unable to call 911. In June, customers were unable to call the number for nearly six hours. In March, folks throughout the country couldn't get through. And last year, 7,000 AT&T customers were out of luck if they needed help when a fiber line was accidentally cut. Stay up to date on this story by downloading our app free for Androids and iPhones.
Chattanooga police say a woman tried to kill her ex-boyfriend by running over him. Officers responded to West 12th Street on reports of a pedestrian struck. Police found a man lying in the grass who told them Alexis Thrasher ran over him. And police say surveillance video confirmed Thrasher was responsible. In Grundy County, high school officials have posted a job opening for the head football coach position. Former coach Casey Tate and former assistant coach Greg Brewer were transferred from their positions after five football players were charged with attempted aggravated rape. The team has since been led by interim coach Nick Meeks. A County Sheriff's Office is asking for your help finding a missing woman. This is 57 year old Essie Elaine Valentine. Police say she lived in Ray County for a couple of months and her family reported her missing last month, but she was last seen in June. The family told police she has a drug problem. If you have any information, call 775-7837, the Ray County Sheriff's Office. Well, government agencies are trying to educate children about opioid abuse. The FBI, DEA, and local police created a program that teaches students about the dangers of drugs. The program, called Chasing the Dragons, starts with a 45-minute documentary with no filter or censors. Officials think it's the best approach to teach students about the reality of drugs. After the film, teachers have students talk about it with parents, friends, and siblings. Each year, more than 46,000 people die from drug overdoses in the U.S. That's more people than die from car accidents or gun violence. We reached out to the Hamilton County School System to see if students are taking part in this program, and we have not yet heard back. David? In School Patrol news, Hamilton County Commissioners took a look at the school board's facility plan today, and our Tim Pham explains where the money will go. The entire building plan was unanimously passed at a school board meeting last month. This morning, it was presented to the Hamilton County Commissioners. Superintendent Dr. Brian Johnson outlined a list of 14 different projects to be completed during the next few years. Over the summer, the commissioners approved the first property tax increase in over a decade. $100 million was allocated to the school district, and last month the school board outlined their plan on how to spend it. It includes renovations, mergers, and two new school buildings. The total price tag for the plan is about $125 million. Once approved, the school district will begin a search for an architect to design the new schools. Construction on some of the projects could start as soon as next month. We'll keep you updated on the progress. In the studio, Tim Pham, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Tim. In addition to the $100 million, the district requested an additional $10 million in bond funding. Dr. Johnson said that portion will be repaid to the county. No vote was taken at the commission meeting today, that's coming up next week, but commissioners had high praise for the plan and are expected to approve it. We'll let you know as this goes on. Coming up next on Eyewitness News at 6, a burglar hit homes in Lookout Valley. The dog started barking, so the neighbors looked out and saw this suspicious vehicle in his neighbor's um, driveway. Why police believe this is not the man's first rodeo, Greg Glover has Crime Stoppers coming up next.
We have some pretty clear pictures of a guy who chose trick or trick over treat just a day before Halloween. Well, he didn't count on the surveillance cameras or a vigilant neighbor or you and your helping Crime Stoppers. Here's Greg Glover. You can't just put on a superhero shirt, then go do bad things. Well, I guess you can, but you shouldn't. Those comic book stars are fictional, but they're the good guys. Unlike the man Victor Miller is about to introduce you to. Help find him and earn yourself some reward cash. We always ask if you see something, say something. This neighbor did exactly what we ask, and so we're hoping that the public will come with the information so we can put this person behind bars. See if you'd pass the good neighbor test. It was the morning before Halloween. These pictures show what was going on next door in Lookout Valley. The dog started barking, so the neighbors looked out and saw this suspicious vehicle in his neighbor's um, driveway. That triggered a call to the police and to the victim. Somebody say good boy to that dog. It alerted to this white male who was wearing a shirt that looks to bear the Flash's logo on it. He'd better check his speed. Home security cameras captured his image with no problem. And in this view, his arms don't appear to be loaded with snacks for the Hall of Justice. Offenders are looking for the same things. They're looking for large sums of cash. It could be a collectible. It could be jewelry. It could be the TV or PlayStations. I mean, we see a lot of different things that are taken. His jacket or zippered hoodie also has a logo on the back you might recognize. The shot of his car is not quite as clear. White with a sunroof, maybe a Honda. We ask if you're able to get a video camera system in your home and outside. It may help solve a crime that happens to you or your neighbor and it could help solve a series of crimes. This is likely not this guy's first rodeo. We usually know that offenders don't just offend one time. What this burglar is gonna do, he's gonna go do that to this house, he's gonna go to the next house and do the same exact thing until we lock him up. So we're asking for the public to call into Crime Stoppers, provide that information so we can put him in jail and he's no longer stealing from us. And make a little holiday spending cash in the process. You could be a friend or family member. You could be even his wife or his parents. Call in. He will never know. No one will ever know who you are when you call. We'll issue you an ID number for the case when you call. Up to $1,000 reward is up for grabs. So call tonight. 698-2333. That Crime Stoppers hotline is now manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Cindy David. Greg, thank you. Still to come on Eyewitness News at 6, a tree-killing bug in the Tennessee Valley. And you'll look out there and you'll see it and you'll think, oh, that's a fungus. What can you do to prevent this bug from getting on your trees? Next. Eighteen states are being infected by a bug killing hemlock and spruce trees. 
In 2010, this tiny pest was discovered right here in the Tennessee Valley. Meteorologist Brittany Baggs explains what the bug is and whether it should be a concern for us with our trees brought inside the home during this upcoming holiday season. They look like little white and greenish specks that are supposed to be on a hemlock tree, like a bud, but they're not. It's a living, breathing bug that's relatively new to our area. It was discovered in East Tennessee in 2002 and in the Tennessee Valley seven years ago. But you'll look out there and you'll see it and you'll think, oh, that's a fungus. It's called the hemlock woolly adalgia. During the development stage, it looks white and waxy. It can be either winged or wingless, and it eventually kills the tree by sucking sap. Don Smith, the owner of Sun and Shade Garden, says the bug won't kill your hemlock overnight, but without treating it in less than a year, it will die. Make sure hemlocks are hydrated. They are highly susceptible to drought stress, which can aggravate problems with pests. Keep the roots covered with mulch at least two to three inches thick. The roots prefer cool and moist conditions. And apply fertilizer, but not a nitrogen fertilizer. This can lead to a quicker death of the tree. If you notice these bugs on a hemlock that you eventually bring in during the holidays, Smith says they're not harmful and offers an alternative this holiday season. So get you a live hemlock at your local garden center, hopefully here, and take it in your house, decorate it, leave the root ball on it, put it in a bucket, cover it up with a Christmas cloth. The bug will not spread inside your home. It's interested in the sap in the tree. To save money, Smith recommends leaving the root ball on the hemlock to save money and plant in your yard after the holiday. In the studio, meteorologist Brittany Beggs, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thanks, Brittany. Now we want to check in with Chief Meteorologist Paul Barris. All right, Paul, enough of this gloomy weather. Bring in a little sunshine. How about it? It'll be nice. Yeah, I think it'll happen later tomorrow afternoon. In the morning, though, it's still going to be cloudy. Jet stream's done a little bit of dip, just a little bit to the south of us, and that's where all the action is. Uh, the rain showers are south of us right now, but over the weekend, it's going to start moving back to the north. That's going to let the warmer air start to push back our way. Right now, most of the showers are south of us, but some of this area is going to just skim right across the Tennessee, Georgia, uh, east, northeast Alabama border. So we're going to see a little bit of light rain, but very, very small amounts. The heaviest stuff is going to be well to the south of us. Currently, it's 54 in Cleveland and in the city, 44 Altamont, 52 Dalton, 50 Athens, and 54 out near Murphy. Winds are out of the east northeast at about 7, 59 the high, 53 the overnight low, so 6 degrees spread there because of all the clouds that we had. Just a little bit of rain, one hundredth of an inch at the airport. Four tenths still out near Scottsboro, two tenths Lafayette, and two tenths in LJ today. Dalton only had about a tenth, 59 in Cleveland, less than a tenth. Udawa about a tenth, Eastridge a tenth, Ringgold. And Trenton had about two tenths of an inch of rain. And then further off to the north, we had uh, very little rain, a uh, tenth of an inch out in Uretawa and in Jasper temperatures. And these were mainly highs uh, into the early morning hours, uh, just right after midnight in the mid to upper 50s. The latest Vipercast again is showing this rain just skimming our area overnight and then pushing down to the south and to the east by seven o'clock in the morning. This may be a little slow, it may be a little slower than what. Vipercast is indicating, but still, we're going to see some clearing coming in tomorrow afternoon. The sun will be coming back. There's another cold front off to the north that's going to reinforce the colder air as we move in late Thursday night and into Friday. The winds will be out of the north, so the cold air is going to settle in at least through Friday. And, uh, but it's going to be dry. There's not going to be any rain. As a matter of fact, eastern half of the country looks about as dry as can be. Then by 5 o'clock on uh, Friday afternoon, still a northerly wind and uh, sunny skies. Saturday morning, 7 o'clock, pretty much clear as a bell. And then winds start shifting uh, on Saturday evening, coming out of the south and right into Sunday morning. That's going to increase the cloud cover, and we may have some showers late in the day on Sunday. So tonight we're looking at 50 cloudy skies. Most of the rain showers should be south of us, but some of them could even make it to Chattanooga. Tomorrow, 62. A sprinkle possible in the morning, but it'll be clearing off into the afternoon. Then clear tomorrow night with 41. Seven day forecast, 61 Friday, Saturday 59, and a few more clouds rolling in, and 38 in the morning. That's going to be chilly. Then on Sunday, we're looking at some showers. Still questionable how much rain we're going to get on that one. On Monday, some leftover showers in the morning, and then Tuesday looks nice, and uh, Wednesday it doesn't look bad at all, 62. That's pretty seasonable.
Yeah. Right on mm -hmm. time. Thank Great you, Paul. Paul. Thank you. And sports with Paul Shaheen is next. You've got several things going on. That's right. You know, we've done this story many times the last few years. A new UTC basketball coach. Yeah. You think this guy's going to stick for a while? You know, it sounds like it, but hey, it always does. I know he's got a task on his hands right mm -hmm. now, and that is a quick turnaround from head coach to a season starting this Friday. Jill Jelnick sits down with Lamont Paris as a new era of Chattanooga basketball begins. And some local prep stars signed college scholarships. All that next in sports. A new era of Chattanooga basketball gets underway on Friday night as Lamont Paris makes his head coaching debut with the Mocs at Wyoming. Sports reporter Jill Jelnick had some time recently to sit down one on one with Paris before Friday night's tip off. Welcome into McKenzie Arena, everybody. I'm Jill Jelnick, and joining me now is the new head coach of the Chattanooga Mocs, Lamont Paris. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. No problem, Jill. Pleasure to be here. Um, Eight months now, you've been in Chattanooga. Uh, what is your first impression of the scenic city? First of all, I can't believe it's been that long. It's literally unbelievable that it's been eight months, but uh, the city's been great. It's been great to me. The people are unbelievably nice. It's just a great community. You're coming from Wisconsin, an extensive resume, last seven years with the Badgers, but this is your first time calling the shots as head coach. Yeah. What do you foresee being your biggest challenge? Game day will be obviously different, and uh, everything leading up to that also is different just from a decision-making standpoint. Uh, I will say this, that I was fortunate in my last position to be working with with for two former head coaches gave me a lot of uh, leeway and latitude and that helped bridge the gap. It's no secret this is a very young team. You have no seniors, a handful of juniors and a whole lot of freshmen. When you go about taking on a young team like this, how do you take that into account? How do you make that work? One of the things that you have to recognize is that with this many young guys and also just a new uh, a new staff and a new system altogether. 
you have to be a teacher first, and I think that's with so many young guys, I think that's even more, uh, it's more important that you spend time doing that. We talked to a lot of the players at the start of, of this season, and we asked them, in one word, how would you describe Coach Paris? And a lot of them said loving. I think they have to know that you care about them, and so we do a lot of things to make sure that they know that. It's good. That I'm glad that they would say that because we have some days where I get on pretty good. But uh, but again, I think they do know that where what my intentions are. It's not just, you know, I'm not just a platoon leader and, and screaming at guys. Uh, I spend some time trying to get to know them as well. March. The new era of Lamont Paris era here at UTC starts this Friday when the mocks hit the road to take on Wyoming. Paul, back to you. Some prep stuff to hit now. Thank you, Jill. Today marked the early signing period for basically every sport except football. A handful of local high school players inked college scholarships today, and that included Heritage Flamethrower Cole Wilcox. Wilcox signed to play college baseball at the University of Georgia. Wilcox, a senior pitcher and three-time All-State player, has been clocked at 97 miles per hour. His power on the mound landed him a spot on Team USA's Olympic 18 and under roster this summer. He's been committed to the dogs since his freshman season. It's awesome. Just uh, I've been committed for so long. Just to finally get it on paper, it's, uh, it's been good. And uh, just to know that I'm going to a great school with a great program, it's just awesome. Congrats to him. And Cole wasn't the only local star to sign today. Saudi Daisy pitcher Dylan Perry signed a baseball scholarship to MTSU. Silverdale's Kaylee Phillips signed to play softball at Tennessee. Hamilton Heights basketball star. Jasmine Massengill signed with Holly Warlick's Tennessee Lady Vols. And McCauley's junior Clay will play basketball at Tennessee Tech. He signed today. Two from Baylor softball team signed. Cheyenne Lindsay signs with the Florida Gators. And then Carmi Rich from Baylor signs with Lipscomb. We have those pictures. We got them in-house late, so they're online right now, and we'll have them okay. updated at 11. Love it when you do these happy stories about kids advancing good their careers. Stuff, isn't That's it? nice. To the right. coaches, players, parents, and high schools that didn't let us know. Yeah. I'm not going to say it. Bring no. them in. Send Come them on. in. Come on. <laughs> we can get them on. All right. Paul, what about tonight? You're not psychic, right? No. no I, I, the people <laughs> accuse me of not being psychic. Either. What? All I right. tried. That's all right. I, you can't be. All right. Let's take a look <laughs> at your evening out. We got temperatures that are going to be, uh, well, it's 54 now, and they're not going to really change that much. 51 at about 9 o'clock tonight and about 52 at midnight. Maybe even yeah. just going up and down. Easy enough. Have a good evening.
pay the bills. That's, that's all it is, you know. If you don't mind going to, you, you, you take the money from that place, that's right. Well, that's why so many people... I mean, Continuing coverage of the Texas church. That would be awesome.